In some ways, AMD has become NVIDIA, and it's not necessarily a bad thing in this instance. The way the new Ryzen CPUs scale is behaviorally similar to the way GPU Boost 4.0 scales on GPUs, where simply lowering the silicon operating temperature will directly affect performance and clock speeds. Under complete full stock settings, a CPU running colder will actually boost higher now. Alternatively, if you're a glass half empty type, you could view it as the CPU running hotter, causing thermal throttling. Either way, frequency is contingent upon thermals, and that's important for users who want to maximize performance or pick the right case and CPU cooling combination. If you're new to the space, the way it has traditionally worked is just CPUs will run at one spec with one set of frequencies until hitting TJ Maxx or maximum junction temperature. Ryzen 3000 is significantly different from past CPUs in this regard, and we're going to explore this today with some additional work that we did from our live stream where we overclocked the 3900X. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the Gamers Nexus Toolkit on store.gamersnexus.net. Our brand new toolkit just launched and contains 10 custom-made drivers for video card disassembly, repasting, and teardowns. The eight core tools are made of high-quality chromium vanadium alloy steel that's built for long service life and resistance to wear during use. The other two tools are carbon steel hex heads that were custom ground down for capacitor clearance on video cards. All the tools are easily mounted to a pegboard or stored in the GN-made tool bag for easy transport. Learn more at the link in the description below. An Intel CPU is probably the easiest foil to Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. With Intel, you have really only two parameters to consider. There's the turbo boost duration, which we have a whole separate content piece on, including MCE discussion. And then there's the power limitations. And beyond that, thermal is only a factor once you get up to TJ Maxx, for the most part. So the way this works is if operating within spec outside of the turbo duration limit, which is 90 to 120 seconds on average, depending on what the motherboard vendor has done on their end, the CPU will stick to one all core speed for the entirety of its workload. And there's no modulation within that speed. So you could be running the Intel CPU at 40 degrees. You could be running it at 90 degrees. And as long as you're not at TJ Maxx, you'll get one frequency out of it, whatever they define for the most part in their, in their turbo boosting tables. So it'll be the same frequency. So once you hit TJ Maxx, say it's maybe 95 or 100 degrees Celsius, you either get thermal throttling on the multiplier, so you get multiplier throttling, or you get a thermal shutdown. And the choice between the two will vary depending on which motherboard you've chosen for your platform. AMD Ryzen, by contrast, behaves more like modern GPUs. The positive way to look at this is pretty simple. Out of the box, the companies are now maximizing performance to the best of their thermal, power, and current conditions with granular steps and frequency along the volt frequency curve. This is also using thermal as a gauge for where on the curve the silicon should operate given the current condition. This means that there's less overclocking headroom. It means that as a testing environment, it's a lot harder to get like-for-like -like benchmarks because the companies no longer have to tune for a worst case scenario. But that also means that the out of box performance is nearing the maximum reasonable performance achievable by manual overclocking. So primarily this is mostly a good thing because just like with GPU boost, the Ryzen CPUs are boosting to their maximum thermal capabilities as opposed to the alternative, which would be AMD setting a, a lower boost frequency to account for the worst case scenarios and then giving the user more overclocking headroom. So you get one or the other, but ultimately the out-of-box performance does matter quite a bit because most people don't overclock. Factually, that is, that is the way it is. So that's the way to look at it. The best way to demonstrate how frequency scales with thermal, which is what we're doing today, we just have one chart, it's very simple, is to simply run a few tests. We're using the Gigabyte X570 Master Motherboard for this, and we're running a, a CPU stock. So it's the Ryzen 9 3900X, it's a 12-core CPU. Keep in mind that as you increase frequency across all cores, it has significantly more impact than if you increase frequency across one core. So if you run a CPU with, let's say, uh, a frequency that's maybe 150 megahertz higher, all core in Blender versus the 150 megahertz lower option, the difference will emerge there more. You'll have a, a more of a percent change than you will if you're running a more single-threaded workload like a game or like Cinebench one-threaded, something like that, where it's, it's just an increase on a single core. Uh, further. What we are doing, running stock, is allowing Precision Boost 2 to do its thing. We have a separate video with excruciating detail on what Precision Boost means uh, and how it's different from Precision Boost Overdrive, or PBO. You may have seen those letters lately. And also how it's different from Auto OC, which is not part of the Precision Boost feature set or the Precision Boost Overdrive feature set. It's in the same menu, but it's a different thing. So to be extremely clear here, 
Precision Boost Overdrive, or PBO, is explicitly different from Precision Boost 2. And the reason we're pointing that out is because we're using just stock, full stock settings, zero changes. All we've done is run the CPU more or less out of the box, and we're going to go from there. So there's no PBO enabled here. It's just the native Precision Boost 2, which is considered stock. And uh, if you're uncertain about any of this, all of this is also in the AMD review guide where they say to disable PBO for stock operation. So hopefully that's fairly clear. All PBO does is bypass current limits. So it bypasses PPT, it bypasses TDC, and it bypasses EDC. And all of those are in the separate video if you don't know what those are. So all that said, we're controlling temperatures within a range of about 84 degrees Celsius T die, or the die temperature of the CPU, and down to minus 80 degrees for the uh, for T pot for the LN2 pot temperature. And uh, this is also there's no more TCTL, so we don't have to worry about that here. It's just straight T die until we get sub zero, and then the reading bugs out, and we have to go from a thermocouple that we've attached separately. So let's get into it. The chart coming up will show frequency and Cinebench score versus temperature. It's a very straightforward test. We're going to be manually tuning the T-die temperature on the CPU for each test pass. So the cooling solution here is 100% irrelevant. It doesn't matter what we use to cool it as long as we control the temperature. The CPU doesn't know what's on top of it. It doesn't know if there's a liquid cooler or an air cooler or an Allen 2 pot. All it knows is the temperature it's operating at. So this allows us to see the range of performance under various cooling conditions. It'll allow us to demonstrate the actual real-world impact of good case and cooler combinations on your CPU. And we'll start with more of a real-world warm scenario, then go to not real-world, to sub-zero, and just see if the scaling continues. The chart starts at about 84 degrees Celsius, which is where you might be sitting with a 3900X and a stock cooler with the average modern case in uh, a room that is lightly air conditioned. At 84 degrees, we measured frequency between 3975 megahertz and 4000 megahertz, sticking closer on average to, let's call it 3975, maybe 3980 once you average it out on the 12 core CPU. As we manually dialed our temperature to reach 78 degrees, we averaged 4050 megahertz all core frequency, and 71 degrees Celsius for T-Dye put us around 4075 megahertz all core for reference, with a step down to 61 degrees, a 10 degree drop, improving all core frequency notably to 4150 megahertz. And remember, this is just Cinebench here, but the, the scaling should continue in pretty much any application based on thermal. The next step is to 55 degrees, where we saw an improvement to 4200 megahertz. Uh, with a bit of averaging in there, it becomes more of maybe 4190 or so, 4185, but 4200 megahertz uh, after multiple runs at that sustained temperature. This is not delta T over ambient, as the only important thing here is the actual operating temperature. Ambient, for what it's worth, was 21 degrees, but we're showing CPU temperature anyway, so that's not relevant at the moment. What is relevant is that an ambient temperature of 21 to 25 degrees might be common for an air-conditioned house, depending on where you live and how you like to keep it cooled and adjust as needed if, uh, if you do keep it warmer. Case ambient is often approaching a range of 30 degrees, even on a good case in a 21 degree Celsius environment with our test systems we use for case reviews. So a 55 degree load temperature is achievable primarily with high-end cooling solutions and well-ventilated cases. It's doable. You can actually achieve this if, if you try. But this is the end of our common real world scenarios, whereas the 78 to 84 range would represent a stock cooler load condition with a decent case we can go further, we can go lower than that and see what it looks like later. So down to 36 degrees, we see scaling continue to 4225 megahertz. Again, this is across all cores. And at 18 degrees, we average roughly 4260 with individual cores bouncing around a bit more than we saw previously. Eventually, we stop scaling at minus 80 degrees Allen 2 pot temperatures or T pot. So the CPU is somewhere between zero and minus 80. We don't know exactly where because we've lost the sensors at this point. So the all core frequency at minus 80 T pot is 4300 megahertz, all core fixed, never changing. That's really good. So cold bugs were encountered after this. We hit them about minus 81 to minus 85. As for CB marks, those scale relatively linearly with frequency. The range from 84 degrees T die to 55 degrees T die, which are the max and min of the reasonable temperatures a user might encounter uh, from not spending a lot on cooling to being try hard on cooling, that range is about 4% performance increase. Just from a lower CPU temperature on the CPU, zero changes. We're not overclocking. This is not PBO. This is stock. The same thing would happen if you did this on a GPU, like an NVIDIA GPU. So this is why cooler and case selection matter a lot with Ryzen and why we as a review outlet have to be careful to maintain 
uh, a fixed cooling condition for testing, a fixed environment. We run AC at the same temperature the whole time for all of our CPU tests, and, and all that impacts the frequency and the scores. So the maximum scale, not that it's particularly relevant to users, is about 6.4% from 3120 points to 3319 points, scaling from minus 80 to 84 degrees positive over zero Celsius. We're basically at GPU boost behavior on a CPU at this point. In this regard, we can use liquid nitrogen as a really neat utility for carefully controlling the temperature. Rather than dumping LN2 into the pot, we can run fairly dry and set temperatures to whatever value we want them to be. Manual application of LN2 allows us to keep fairly consistent temperatures with a range of roughly plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius from the test begin to test end segments. A lot of people will probably overlook the fact that while LN2 is indeed cold, the CPU is only as cold as we allow it to run. With minimal LN2 use and just a cold LN2 pot, we can get the CPU to run at 84 degrees, which is really hot for LN2 as a solution, but obviously it depends how much you modulate it. And we can operate under the same thermal conditions as a stock cooler in a warm case. So this allows us to test with greater granularity and accuracy as we can dial the temperature to whatever we want rather than being limited by coolers available and having to swap them out all the time. So from here, you can extrapolate the thermal data to know how hard you want to brute force your cooling. But colder is definitely better with rise, and there's obviously a, a point of diminishing returns. But you really can't go too crazy with cooling for this chip. We saw scaling all the way to sub-zero, which you're, uh, you're not going to get that. I mean, most people are not running chillers. Maybe you pipe in some air from outside in the winter or something. But on average, most people are obviously running at or above ambient, in the best cases, uh, maybe at, with a low workload or something. So, yeah, point is, if, if you're, you've got some money and the only thing holding you back between buying some crazy tricked out cooling solution and going a step down is you're not sure if it's worth it, 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 as long as the cooling solution has a difference in temperature and thermal performance, it will produce a difference. It'll, it'll create a different result. Is it worth it? Well, obviously that starts coming down to the money argument, and that's going to depend on how much money you have to spend on your computer. A lot of the time, you could take the extra 50 bucks that you might spend on one class better cooler and sink it into a GPU upgrade uh, going from, well, going from like, a, a, this is a low end, but 5700 to 5700 XT, that's $50. That performance gap will be bigger than the performance increase you see from better cooling. But if you, if you don't really have much of a budget, better cooling solutions certainly aren't going to hurt. It's not like Intel CPUs where once you, once you kind of have it controlled, there's no benefit to going better um, other than reducing power leakage. And for reducing power leakage, you get about a 4% reduction in power consumption by the chip for every 10 degrees Celsius or so that you drop the core temperature. But is that a value? Well, not really. So anyway, Pretty cool stuff, uh, literally in some cases. What we need to do next is obviously look at thermal solutions individually and uh, subscribe to make sure you can catch that content. This was filmed and I, I edited this one, so our editors didn't get involved. They've got another break. And uh, I will be flying to California for an EVGA charity live stream where I'm battling with Jay, Jay's two cents, with uh, Kingpin as the referee for an LN2 overclocking thing. So if you want to catch that, check on Tuesday. We're going to try and stream that. Otherwise, it'll be on their channel as well. So yeah, point is, we'll look at more thermal solutions once back. But really interesting data. Uh, how useful is it? Well, you see a scaling of about 4-ish percent under reasonable conditions. So does that matter? That'll depend on you. But we wanted to present it and show that Ryzen actually really cares. So when we go on rants for 20 minutes about how much a case is terrible at cooling, this is the situation where it's going to matter a lot. It also means that we can't really use the Ryzen chips easily in a case test bench because the frequency will scale. So you have to start plotting frequency plots in addition to the temperature plots, and the temperature plots aren't exactly accurate because your frequency is changing, so it's no longer like for like. So anyway, uh, yeah, pick a good case and a good cooler if you can afford it, and uh, don't feel too bad if you can't. You still get reasonable performance. It's just that obviously uh, it's a bit better with colder. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, like by picking up one of these toolkits that we have or by picking up one of our mod mats or shirts if you want something a bit cheaper. And that all helps fund things like doing the research we've done today and buying more of this stuff. So I'll see you all next time.